Hello, hi. Just checking you can all see me. Um, and welcome to our LRNG client collab where we get to spend an hour together with some of our amazing client partners and tell really, really great stories, we hope, but also that we leave you some with some ignition and some inspiration. So I'm Pamela Barletta. I'm going to be your moderator for this afternoon's conversation. And um, I, I think I count myself one of the lucky ones because I get to spend a bit of time with Tembi every two weeks or so. And um, we we have conversations that cross all boundaries um, and that range from personal to professional. And we're very chuffed to have you in the room with us today and in this conversation where we invite you into one of those really privileged spaces that I, I have the, the opportunity to be part of. So Tembi joins us, Tembi Mayene. She is the head of digital learning at, at NetBank. Um, and we are deeply privileged to have her in the room and an honor to have all of you with us online. So Tembi, good afternoon and welcome to you. Afternoon, Pam. Afternoon, everyone. So glad thank to be here. You. Thank you. And thank you for your time too. So um, we're the plan for today, and you know how these conversations go, is that we will take you through um, some of the insights and nuggets of wisdom that Tembi will share with us on the subject of when people grow, business grows. We will also look at lessons and insights that Tembi can share with us that we, we can cre create this community of practice where we don't have to know all the answers, um, but perhaps we just need to know someone who's been through something that's similar. And then um, finally, it's such a beautiful story of when you get to know Tembi, where you see passion and purpose meet. And when we when the when you think about when people grow, the business grows. When I if you if I were to describe Tembi to you, I would say to you that that epitomizes who she is. And we're really, really fortunate to to have her as part of the LRMG client partners. So we are going to ask you uh, to pop any questions that you might have for us in the chat, um, and then we'll lift those up during um, the course of the conversation. So Tembi, let's jump straight into it. When people grow, business grows. And um, I was reading the 2024 Deloitte Human Capital Trends Report recently, where it's, I mean, it's a fascinating report, but in essence, the, trade, the, the insight says that we understand that leaders already understand that focusing on human performance is key to building an organization that can thrive for today and tomorrow. So over to you in terms of what do you believe the business case for this is as such a critical topic in, in what we are all doing every single day? Thanks, Pam. I think it's so critical because if you look at the research out there in terms of when people grow, businesses grow, it says that companies where the leaders believe that and they act it out in their leadership outperform their competitors uh, by over 1.5%. Uh, oh, not percent, 1.5. So that means consistently they will outperform because people who feel valued in an organization then put in that discretionary effort. And that's where that top performance comes from. Uh, and so when leaders start to get that from people and value people and interact with them, not like cogs <laughs> on a wheel, but interact with them as people who came to achieve a purpose within the business, then the business will thrive. Um, and the research also says that it's not just about outperformance immediately, it's not about short term, but that those businesses outperform and are more sustainable in the future. Uh, so from a numbers perspective, I like to start there with my businesses to just go from a numbers perspective, from a bottom line conversation, it makes money sense to invest in your people, to believe in them and treat them um, the way that they should be treated. Because if we're really realistic about it, the honesty is that the buildings don't make money. When you're going to a business, it's not the walls that make the money, but it's the people who work every day and put in that effort who you know start to turn and, and bring in that profit for the business. Mm, yeah, I'm fascinating because as I'm listening to you, I'm also thinking of a of a framework which is a, a Harvard paper of twenty odd years ago, but in essence brings to life exactly what, what exactly what you've articulated now, and that's the the causal impact and, and effect of the the impact that leaders have on an organization 
and what that does to drive engagement, as you said, discretionary effort into a client context and then ultimately confidence with regard to business performance. So let's start there then, because I think one of the challenges we have um, most of, of us as human practitioners, human resource practitioners have is, is telling that story about the numbers because it does come from a, conf a confidence base, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you, or how have you facilitate the, facilitated those types of conversations either in your current role or in, in prior roles? How do you join the dots so that the business sees that intersection of human performance and business value? I think it's really important. So my starting point is always the business strategy. So do I get it? Uh, and a lot of the consulting work that I do when people call me and they go, can you help me look at the strategy? What am I not doing right? Has always been, where's your business strategy? Can we start there? Have you looked at it? So I have a lot of HR professionals who reach out and L&D professionals. And I go, let's, let's just look at your business strategy and then go, so where's your HR strategy flowing from that business strategy or where's your learning strategy flowing from that business strategy? So I've always made it a point to, to have that as my starting point so that I don't lose track. So that when I sit with uh, my stakeholders, I'm not talking from my perspective on the measurements that I think would be valuable. Mm -hmm. I go, this is what you said you want to achieve from a business perspective, and this is how I've enabled it. And that helps me really draw that line. Uh, it's not an easy thing, but it's a, it's a journey because part of the things I've had to do is to say from a business perspective, they say they want to do cost saving. And then it's thinking about, so how do we achieve the cost saving? Part of the elements of cost saving in, in one of the businesses that I supported was let's look at AI. Let's look at what can we automate? What can we think of rationally that we can do or teach our people? Because they're more knowledge workers, that they were in a finance technical environment what can we teach them about AI that will really turn and lead us to that cost saving? And what we took people through is let's learn low code, no code translation things. Um, what could you make different in your world? Part of the things that we've done, and this is a story I always love to tell, is the lady who was able to automate, learn the skills on how to automate work that used to take her two weeks and then it took her less than two minutes yeah. through that skill building. And then I could come back to business and say, you want a cost saving. I've now saved costs from the time that you pay this person. Uh, and it's, for me, I always started in a place where you measure your charge out rate. So take a charge out rate and go multiply <laughs> by those two weeks. And that's an amount that you can start talking about. And to not look for big points of data. We have data points all around us from an HR perspective to go, how can I look at that from a money perspective? How can I then translate that to a strategy and a like a strategy point uh, for my business? And that's the conversation hook. So I've always tried to make that link. Um, part of it, for example, was another stakeholder. And we kept on getting these letters from SAR saying a fine is coming. And it was because there was human error in the process that we're busy running with and that would lead to fines from SARS. Then we looked at, okay, how can we follow the same process of automation, teaching people and, and removing the hands that touch the process. And from that, we could go, now we've reduced the fines. Um, but from a, a learning and HR perspective, it feels far-fetched to go, that was my contribution, but it is. Um, because that person went into a learning program to learn a skill that they applied in their role, and that had a monetary contribution back into the business mm -hmm. that then links to that strategy. And then it, it makes the conversation so different because your business counterparts now trust you that you are a business partner. I think sometimes we throw the word around that you're a true business partner because what you're concerned about is what they're concerned about. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And and I think the the point being that when I when I hear you share your examples, I'm almost hearing that there is a curiosity there, right? There is a there because it's easy enough to look at something and go, "There's a problem," okay, and do whatever it is we do with our hands. Um, and we know that curiosity is about knowledge, but application is actually about the skill, right? Mm -hmm. So if you continue with this theme of the story, so working backwards from the data or the confidence for business, looking at that relative to strategy, then then how do you ensure that you're you're providing people with the skills that are aligned to driving those business strategy conversations? Because let's be honest, not all leaders have the patience 
So to your point, it may not be immediate. So, so talk to us ab about how you've navigated all of those amazing business landmines. The curiosity is always key for me. It's a thing that I live by. Uh, I'm curious to understand other people's worlds and other people's perspectives. So it's always been a guiding principle for me. But I think most key is that my curiosity also believes in action. So be curious, but do something with that curiosity. So I love to experiment. Um, and I think what has really helped me is to have the grace of leaders who give me the space to do that experimentation because the fear is gone of if it fails, it might fail. Um, but really it's that I was curious to look at the strategy and go, how can I add value? Um, and then go and experiment and try different things. Um, I think I always tell you that I don't come from an HR traditional background. Uh, and so when I moved into HR, I didn't have an HR qualification either. I come from a finance perspective and, and that's my education <laughs> standpoint. And so when I came into HR, a lot of the conversations are going, I went into L&D, but it would talk about L&D, but it's a part of a team. It's part of HR. And therefore in HR, there's OD, there's all of these other talent pieces. And so I would literally be curious enough to go, what if from a from a learning perspective, we also linked to the future role, for example, of a, of a business manager or a finance manager. And then let me go learn from an OD perspective. If we have to write out the, you know, the future business role for this person, let me look at the research that's out there. Let me partner with people who might know better than me. Uh, part of that I did with EY at some point, and I was like, come help me here. <laughs> I, I, I want to know more about what is the future of a finance leader uh, and what are the skills that they would require, for example, and help me articulate that uh, from an OD perspective so that when I translate it to learning, it makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. But it came with curiosity and experimentation and being also given the room that it's okay to try these things. Um, and for me, putting up my hand as well, and going, I'm going to try it. Can I have the support uh, should anything go wrong? Um, and, that, and luckily, not much has gone wrong. <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're one of the lucky ones. So that's such an interesting perspective in terms of how you show up with curiosity and that you translate that into action. How do you ignite and inspire the, the the colleagues around you and and the people within your current uh, within the current bank how do you ignite that because it's one th and because it's a mindset right it's it's a choice that we make to either lean in and be curious or to sit back and wait for for something to be spoon fed to us no definitely it is such a mindset shift um i always try and go one person at a time uh and uh it it for me, it's to make the difference by one person at a time. We say I'm not an extrovert uh, by any <laughs> stretch of the imagination, uh, even though my job requires me to show up that way. And so even my networking has always been, I will have that one conversation and influence that one individual. I think part of it has also been finding the right individuals to influence. You know, the people who are the influencers around. So have a conversation with them. Uh, and I've also made it a point to just be, I will find that one executive, for example, who I know is leading the conversation and the thing that I want to do great in, let me go have a conversation with them. I don't have to be fancy in a big crowd, but I can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation where I can influence something. Mm -hmm. And then to just go, okay, now I've done the one person, what else can we do? Um, and, and part of changing people's mindsets, I've also learned, is just do it. <laughs> do the thing. Uh, and put it out there. Uh, a lot of the times we wait for someone to say, yes, it's right. But some people are just more visual and they want to see the thing that you've built or you're saying you're going to build or build it. Uh, put in that discretionary time. Uh, I think my family has now understood sometimes I put the kids to bed and I'm like, I just need two more hours. And I take those two hours <laughs> to work on my extra projects of things I want to change. So recently with our DLPs of the learning uh, platform, I changed yeah. the look and feel. I did say to people, I'm going to change it. Um, and, and I was saying to people, I'm focusing on learning experience, but people didn't get what I was saying about learning experience until they went to the new version and went, 
oh my gosh, I can find my thing so much easier. Um, I didn't realize that having all of these things together causes so much clutter in my world and overwhelm when I open and I want to learn and I don't know where to start. And actually having things clear on just the landing page even has helped me feel like, actually, I know the skills I'm meant to focus on. And sometimes it just takes that thing of, for me, one person at a time, make that difference, network differently, but also just go out and do it. Uh, put in that extra discretionary effort for the things you believe in. Uh, mm. And then you can influence people differently. For sure. And Marius has just uh, put a comment in the chat to say, it's so easy to create a learning culture by celebrating learning and growth as a result. Um, and, and that's, isn't that just, yeah, it summarizes what you've said so beautifully. Thank you, Marius, for that contribution. Yes, it's so beautiful. We recently had a, a session where we collected stories from around the organization of people to come share their journeys. And it was amazing to hear where people started from. Uh, we had a learning exec come and talk about how he started as a security guard and then wow. decided he wants to work at a bank and went to work at a bank, like in a teller environment. And he was interested in customer service and excellence. And so he became the bar for customer excellence. And so it was teach other people. And that's how he landed up in learning. Um, and, and actually that learning culture of just sharing the stories of how people learn and grow and make that, you know, those steps towards with their goals. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Mm. And, and I mean, Tembi, just your story now around um, your ignition to change the learning experience or the learner experience, um, the, the, the impact of that to your to the comments where you said people have uh, didn't realize how cluttered it was how noisy it was etc that um, when I hear you say that I, I draw the immediate correlation between when people grow the business grows because ultimately you're you're creating the space right in that context for people to yeah. enjoy learning to want to learn um, and to be better Yes, definitely. And and that's how we start to tell the story between the things that we do and how we're adding value to business. Because from a business perspective, the goal is to be a talent magnet, to be a place where people see the organization as a place where they can learn, they can grow, they can pursue their ambitions, and they don't have to ask for permission to do that. And so when you create a learning space where people go, actually, I don't need to ask my manager about this. I can literally go to this platform I can find the skills that I want to build for my current role and the future without feeling overwhelmed and be clear what are the skills that are, are necessary for the organization. We've already made that link. And the important thing I always say is we already have the seat at the table. So I'm not fighting for a seat to tell my story, but my story gives me that voice. Um, and I think the smarter we are about activating that voice with the that get your data together and tell a clean story from strategy to your contribution. Then you've hit the mark. Then you're activating that voice um, within that seat that you already have. Um, HR doesn't have to fight for a seat at the table. We are firmly in that table. Um, it's just the stories we tell. Yeah. Gosh, I love that. That's so powerful. I'm going to have to repeat it. So we have a seat at the table. Just need to activate our voice through stories informed by data to yes. be heard. Yes, sure. and the more we do that, the more that we don't have to struggle for business to see our value. We don't have to struggle for us as well to see our value. We're not step cousins. I think sometimes we, we get into the terms of step children or, or cousins because we feel sometimes that we're less than, but the stories that we have, the data points that we have from an HR perspective are incredible. Um, the ability that we have from an HR perspective to have a look at the business and go, I know where the high potential employees are. I can make a correlation between our development and who is our high performers. So I can literally say the more learning, the better the performance. Uh, I can also say actually the more we invested in our learning, the less our attrition because we have all of those data points, but that's not how we tell the story. Um, and that's where we lose the voice at the table. Yeah. I am, um, for those of 
if those on the in the meeting know I love to read, but one of my all-time favorite authors is Greg McEwen. And um, his most recent book talks about it, it's coined effortless, but it, re it references the fact that we must do what matters most. And when I hear you um, share your insights, it's about your, you're so clear around what needs to be done. Do you drive it with focus, but there is depth to it, whilst at the same time, it's it's not complex because you're you're just able to articulate it so beautifully and uh, I'm sure everyone's hanging on to your every word because it's a yeah it's something we can hook into and and almost quote Tembi Miene from Nanbang <laughs> who said <laughs> oh, thanks Pam but I had a call yesterday from a, a colleague at another bank and they and they were talking about passion that it's the passion that drives us for these things that we do the work that we do we didn't land by mistake um, we intentionally went into a people space to make the difference. Uh, and so while we might come across the hurdles, uh, the passion comes through when we speak about our jobs. So sometimes I think it's the passion that's leading the conversation. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. But that's, as we said, passion and purpose, when they come together, it's a match made, right? So, so Tembi, share with us just in terms of the role of leadership. So in in how how you activate and and partner with leadership in the space of understanding that their role in this people investment and people development to drive business impact? Oh, it's so critical. I, I was sharing the other day, I think, with you that I've done two research papers now on the role of leadership um, and how criti critical it is because sometimes it's just reminding leaders that they are the bar at which employees place what are the acceptable behaviors within an organization and, and which aren't. So even from a growth perspective, in even in a value of learning and growth, um, value for just development, leaders are the bar. And sometimes we just need to remind them that we're not saying big brothers were watching, <laughs> but every employee is watching. Mm -hmm. um, and they're watching to see what you value as a leader, because it actually doesn't matter the nice things that we write on our value statements as an organization. Um, what matters is what people experience on a day-to-day -day basis and they experience you as a leader. Mm -hmm. And and it's critical to know that the relationship that you form uh, with each and every employee is the catalyst for whether they're going to just put in the bare minimum or they're going to put in that discretionary effort. And so the role of a leader is so critical because when Leaders, for example, we have something called Flow Wednesday. I think it's across most banks now and most organizations where we don't have meetings in a particular day. Research has shown that when leaders don't respect that day and they book meetings and they don't understand that it's a time for people to step back and look at their work and consciously think about the, the contribution that they're making, then those teams are not the performing ones. But when leaders actually make the time, they sit with their teams and also share, I'm also reading this. I've also learned that those teams outperform other teams. Mm -hmm. And so it's just also taking those data points and going, research isn't for the outside world. We have internal data points here. And as a leader, do you now see that the thing that you're doing by putting meetings in people's diaries on a day where they should be consciously thinking about their work, consciously thinking about the skills that they need to develop to do even better, you are taking away from performance. So um, you're stealing performance and saying, no, I just need you to finish this today, but you're stealing it from the future. Um, I, I've seen that start to change a, a lot of leaders to go, I'm I'm the blocker here. I'm my team's detriment. Um, and so for me, that that is the critical bit that leaders play such an important role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're almost using the, I'm hearing you say, you're almost using the data on the one hand and, and what, you, what you have access to internally, mm -hmm. but you're, you're overlaying that with your role as coach because you're then using the data to coach um, the leaders around how they show up differently, right? Yes, because they're also individuals in their own right, Shem. Let's <laughs> put it right, right? Because at the end of the day, the leader is doing their job and part of their role is to also build the relationships with everyone while making sure that they're making sure that people are not being uh, lazy and they're doing their jobs 
and they engaged in their work and so they can put in that discretionary effort and find purpose and meaning in their roles. And they're also humans. They also walk in with their own problems. They also have different things going on in their personal lives. And it's to then say, I, I know you as a person, as a leader, and I know the challenges that you're facing. And maybe this is where we need to have a different conversation. Um, I always try and engage every conversation without judgment. My husband still says I have a heart of a child because I'm too forgiving about everything. But to just walk in without the judgment to say, you must have something going on um, because no one comes to work trying to do a bad job. I, I still truly believe that. No one tries to come and I want to burn the building down. They want to do something good. They want to find purpose and meaning in the thing that they do. So how do we have a different conversation at a coaching level um, to go, let's support you to do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Justin saying in the chat, interesting view, Tembi, reminds me of a recent conversation that he tuned into with Mo Gadot. And he says, this week, you don't, uh, the, the, the week you don't work is the week that you are most productive. And he's, he follows it on by saying, do we allow ourselves enough thinking time? Sure, Justin, no. from your lips, right? Do we allow <laughs> ourselves enough thinking time? No, because if, if, if we did, right? Imagine the things that we could do. Um, because if we had enough thinking time, we wouldn't be so busy. Um, because we get stuck in this cycle of activity. Uh, and if you really think about the activity that you're doing, how much of it is actually contributing value? Um, but we get bogged down because we actually don't have time to think and do that stepping back to go, how can I work smarter? <laughs> A lot of people say that, work smart, not hard. But you need to think first to find the smart points to go, yeah. if these were my three goals, what is the one activity that I could do that would achieve all three goals? Not, I need to do three different activities to achieve the goals, but is the one that I could do that would tick all of the boxes. Um, and then I find time. So for me, uh, Justin, it's always the time for me to do the things I love the most. Um, so I love my job, but I'm also curious about many other things. And so when I think about... Uh, my time, I always think, let me step back, reflect really on what am I trying to do and where can I find that extra 20% to go and experiment with the things that I'm curious about. Uh, and without that thinking time, I always feel like something's missing because now I don't have time to play. <laughs> and my play always leads to better things and more amazing things that I could achieve. And so actually we gave ourselves the time and we knew that we are not sacrificing something in the immediate, um, but actually it will lead to greater things. We would give ourselves more time. Wow. So that's so powerful. So Timmy, I mean, let, let, I want to, I want to go into your comment now about play. So how do you, how can we play and experiment in the digital play, playground? So with, I mean, what does AI mean for L and D in this conversation of, um, uh, when when people grow, business grow. And, and then a, a follow-on question in terms of how can we play and create that experimentation space in these digital playgrounds to drive this performance for both the humans and the business? I think the important thing is to understand that technology is not cheating. <laughs> so a lot of experimentation and curiosity requires us to stop thinking that because I've done something quicker, just because I've got help from an AI uh, co-pilot or chat GPT, then it means I've cheated on my work. It means I didn't think this. No, you thought through because you thought about the prompt that you're going to ask the AI to give it back to you. And, and when you get the feedback from chat GPT or co-pilot, you think about it. You rationalize and go, actually, no, this isn't what I'm looking for. And so you put a different prompt. And then you take the bits that make sense to you and you package it with the other additional information that you haven't asked about. So it's actually not cheating. But it, it's a mindset to not think that technology helps us to cheat. It's that it helps us to play better. Um, so for me, I use strategy. I now pay for the extra portion because I'm just like $20 a month for me. It's perfectly fine. I will sacrifice a dinner with somebody so that I can be <laughs> for my chat GPT. But I've moved from creating images to creating actual decks and 
beautiful PowerPoints that everybody then goes, where did you get the template? I'm like, actually, you also have the same thing. Um, and it's about when I want to then put out that story and tell it, I want help on how to, how can I put my best data visualization out there? Uh, and so it, it, it assists. But the first thing is to then just go, I'm not cheating, I'm working smarter. Let me get the help uh, and help is not my fingertips. And so how do I get better at the prompting so that I, I, I get you know to the outcome faster and I create that time uh, because time comes from other time because <laughs> it's mm -hmm. we only all have 24 hours in a day. Don't believe bar one adverts. It's only the 24 hours in a day, but it's how we use it that gives us more time back to then explore the things that excite us and ignite us um, and then we find the gems of things that we can infiltrate back into our roles. Uh, and for me, technology has really been uh, a, a great help, even in the small things. Um, today, I had to create pathways. Um, everyone did, but why, why delve down to pathways? I was like, but I can, and it's not going to take me long. And so I had my co-pilot open on the one side, and I was working on my pathways, and then I'd ask some prompts here and there. But it helped me to just think through on, what am I creating? Um, am I really thinking about my audience? And to just do things differently. It was for a youth program. I'm no longer the 20 year old. And so I'm not sure about, you know, how do I really cater for young people coming into the business, but I could get some pointers and it's use it, you have it. Yeah. Um, I see Boyo's just reinforcing your comment um, in in the chat saying re using resources at your disposal effectively for the benefit of the desired outcome it's like well why aren't we and why don't we and what is that fear that we have in in how we ultimately enable business value and and it's it's the small things right that that we can change uh, I always tell people for example that my learning I access it from teams because that's where you'll find me. I'm, I'm genuinely always on Teams. I'm terrible with my emails, but you'll find me on my Teams. And so my learning, even I access it from there. If I want to share content that I've learned that I thought was a great article, I share it directly from there. And so it's about finding the best place as well for your practical high performance um, and then leveraging that space. Because then you know that you are, you know, hitting your business goals, um, but in a more efficient way, yeah. But let's be honest, Tembi, it's not always smooth sailing. So share with us some of the challenges, right? Come on. It can't be this easy. <laughs> oh, no. it's No, it, it hasn't always been smooth sailing um, at all. I think I remember my in my 20s. So I went to be the head of learning at the PIC at some point. And I'd never worked in government. I had never worked in government. And it was a daunting experience, Um it was only 500 people in the organization. So small organization, but we had a big role for my 20 something old person. That was me at the time. And because as well, I didn't come from OD, I also had a leader who would push me into the scariest corners of HR to go learn something. Uh, I think the first part of it, um, I, I was complaining about wellness because I'd come from a different organization. I was like, this is how wellness can be done. He's like, ooh. Okay, <laughs> one, you don't come from HR, so you don't know wellness, but you want to talk about wellness, here's Wellness Day, plan it for the whole business, you plan it, you get all of the suppliers. And so for the for the first time, I was like, oh, maybe I should be quiet here <laughs> when I think something isn't going right, but I was like, that's not me. I will always say, maybe we can do things differently. And so I took on the challenge, but it wasn't easy because... Was I had to first go research and go maybe well-being and wellness in an organization isn't just the things I'd seen. So maybe it isn't just that one day pop-up that happens and we all get our bloods tested and things like that. And maybe I need to think about things more holistically to drive impact. Um, it came at a great time. We had had um, recent accidents. I think where the office block was wasn't great. So we had a car crash from the road into the office. So people were low. Um one of the guys in investments actually passed away at his desk. He had a heart attack. So I was like, actually, well-being is so more important than that flash that happens that one day. Mm -hmm. So I had to research a lot and go, maybe there's different ways that we can do this and maybe we can stagger this across. Let's think about, you know, what are the conditions that lead someone to be at the office on a Saturday night and pass away by themselves? It's such a lonely experience. Um, it, 
and it made me think broader and and be curious about if I had to step into the different roles um, and think differently at, at trying to make that business impact from a well-being perspective, what could we do? We also had um, people with just a lot of health problems there. And so part of the solutions that were available, I decided to do a park run. I said, let's all get healthy. I'd never organized a park run. I barely ran myself. And I had to call parks department and go, if I wanted to do this for over 200 people, what would I do? Uh, is it available? Can I just book it for a whole organization? But it, it was curiosity and learning and, and figuring out. Uh, I think my first draft of the proposal, the CFO was like, this is massive. <laughs> you need to bring back and, and you know rethink where's the money for all of this going to come from. Um, and I was like, okay, maybe there's, you know, people I can engage. I went to ICAS. It's like, surely, you know, you know, psychiatrists who can come here for free. And <laughs> I'm going to ask the question. And maybe you can just have some free webinars. Come talk to people about, you know, mental health, looking after themselves. It worked out, but it took a lot of failing, going back with that proposal, um, trying different things and going, okay, at the end of the day, what am I trying to achieve? Uh, and then going, if the people are healthy in our business, if their minds are right, if their bodies are right, then the business will thrive. Uh, and so I'm not just doing well-being so that I tick a box, but actually I'm helping the business to succeed and go forward. And I'm helping the individuals live longer as well. And, and because I took that different thinking to what I was doing, I was happy to go through the troubles that I went through. Um, and I was very happy that it finally ended when it did. Um, but it it's not always going to be smooth sailing. Uh, I think I, I've learned that, but it's okay as well to go, maybe I'm going in the wrong direction and how do I pick up and try something different? Mm -hmm. um, and where I do believe that I'm in the right space, I just need more support. How do I garner that extra support? Um, I think we were speaking about it the other day and going, sometimes we hold on to a path because we go, oh, we've already sunk too deep yeah. here. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's okay to let go and go, Maybe this thing that I was trying wasn't going to work out. Let me try a different avenue. But focusing on what was my goal to begin with. Um, and that has always then helped me stay. Like my That's always been my true north. Um, yeah. So, Tembi, in the context of the future of, of learning and the, yeah, the future of learning in this particular conversation, if I were to put you on the spot and say, what's the future of learning to ultimately enable business growth. What is that in, in a short sentence? So because I work in a tech role, right, a lot of people want me to say it's technology, but it isn't. Technology is an enabler. Um, the future of learning is people. It's people oriented. We need to stop scaring people about you're going to lose your job. It's going to end. AI is going to take over. We need to say to people, find meaning, find purpose. What is it that excites you? Oh, Tammy's muted. You've muted, Thames. Oh, no. I wanted to back. Yes, sorry, I'm back. Um, so for me, it is going to people and helping them find where the business meets their interests. So business goals meets their interests. So what does the world need uh, and how does that align to what I want to do? Um, I think when people find meaning and they find purpose, that's the future of learning. Um the tech is there to support. I, I love tech. I learn on my phone, on my kids' tablets. I steal it. I encourage my kids to go into coding. My kid was just doing an app now and she's eight. And I'm just like, yeah, that's the stuff. Technology is great. It will always be there and it's going to continue to evolve. But people don't grow because of technology. It's an avenue of learning. Um, and actually we're social people as well. And I think people forget that. Uh, we learn from other people. We learn from actual experiences. Um, before tech, we touch things <laughs> to learn that the stove is hot and I shouldn't, you know, touch it. So let's go back to those things uh, and remember that people are social. Let's go back to coaching uh, and mentoring uh, and having conversations with each other and helping the next person. Um, mm -hmm. Someone was surprised the other day that I have this great template uh, for PowerPoint. And I shared it and I was like, yeah, yeah, please have it. <laughs> this is what it's done. Because... People are so used to people not sharing knowledge and sharing resources anymore. So the mm. future of learning is us going back to being human. Um, we can leverage the technology to help us in the journey, but let's be human. 
Yeah, humanize the humans. Is that what you said the other day? <laughs> yes, humanize the human, go back to what, you know, to our true selves and the business will happen. Um, mm -hmm. I, I always go back to research. I think now I've fallen in love with research uh, after doing two masters and starting a doctorate. At the end of the day, when people find purpose and meaning in the things that they do, they will do over and above what you expect them to do. Mm -hmm. because you've unlocked that engagement uh, engagement doesn't take um we always think that it is it's an experience using technology but engagement is just unlocking meaning for people for sure for sure okay lovely so um my last question before we then pop up um, and bring in some voices from from our audience is just in terms of measuring impact. So you've shared with us earlier, just in terms of the, the what is the strategy and ultimately driving towards that. Could you give us some examples of um, business metrics or business KPAs or KPIs where you were able to join some of, some of the value in terms of growing people to grow business? Yeah, definitely. So I'm happy to share that. So a part of the things, like I said, one was the cost. Um, the second, for example, is automating and that we want to move away from manual work. So generally, that's the business goal you'll find or the business metric. We want to do less um, wasteful work or we want to save time. Find those things that relate to the people in the strategy and it makes it easier from an HR perspective to link um, back into that, into those business metrics. For me, that's always been the trick to go where, let me look at the goals and go which ones actually touch people that people actually will achieve um, and then go, so how can I enable that? Um, so for me, those ones have been really easier to, to, to really link. And where I don't understand, because sometimes it's how we write our business goals and, and go, okay, so if, for example, you want to in, you know improve return on equity, what would that take? Um, and, and what are the kind of skills, for example, that would be needed for the bank to improve its return on equity? Then I can drill down to go, that's where I'm going to make the shift. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't want to ask the questions because we don't want to seem like we don't know, but we don't know. Uh, and so rather ask the question earlier rather than later to find the point of impact. Um, I found that to be the most meaningful um, because then you can quickly draw the line to, this is where I can make a difference. Um, and some of the metrics have been related to talent. So for example, a lot of the, the banks have uh, the regulators on their back about succession plans uh, and that the top tier uh, executives must have uh, successes and those successes must have clear succession plans. That's an easy win from, from a talent perspective, but it's the quality. So what the regulators are fighting for is the quality of the succession plans. Oh, and the development plans for those successes. And mm -hmm. so you're able to quickly find a point. I, I found that to be a great place for me to add value because now I'm not just adding value to my immediate business. I'm adding value even from a banking industry perspective that goes to regulators. So that even for me, from finding meaning in my work, uh, I'm not just the person, I always give the analogy of building a table. I'm not just putting a screw in, but I understand that the big picture is that from an economy perspective, the banks add so much value, they're such big players, that we need to know if something happened to our leaders, what would happen and how are we building the next generation of leaders to support the banks that you know support the, our economy. And understanding that has significantly changed the way I apply myself in my job. Um, mm -hmm. Because now I know that even if my part of learning is just the screw on the table. I know that we're building a table. Um, and then I can go and learn about how do we put on a leg or how does the glass top fit on top? Um, and I can, you know, uh, move around with my skill set. Uh, but just also just seeing the bigger picture, I guess that's that's the point. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And I suppose it, it also talks to, you've got to really understand your business, your industry um, to be able to to truly link it to those business outcomes. So we're gonna invite Nadine on, on screen with us to join the panel. Um, so Nadine is part of our LRNG Talent Development Division. Um, and Nads has been watching the chat for us and will um, lift up a couple of questions um, and a couple of voices as well. Nadine, welcome. 
Thank you so much, Pam. Thank you so much, Tembi, for such a wonderful, meaningful conversation. I can't believe it's already quarter to five. I wish we could just carry on I know, for right. a few more hours <laughs> because it's just such an inspirational topic. And um, there's been such amazing comments in the chat. So I'm going to start off with um, Erwin. Erwin says, Tembi, such, such beautiful connection you've made to the value of humanness in a tech world to find purpose. Can you see the opportunity for technology to create human sustainability equals doing good by workers and in the world at Nedbank? Question. Yes. Oh my gosh. So tech isn't an enemy. I guess. <laughs> I guess that's that's the first bit, right? And the better we partner, the better we know uh, how to leverage it, um, how to use it for our benefit, the better the outcomes um, we can get to. Um, I, I always say that a bank is such a big place. And, and I've seen, for example, we have a game farm <laughs> and we have employees who work in the game farm. So they're not your typical banker, but it's easy to forget them and as part of our bank. Uh, and my big, my big goal for the year is to make sure that they are enabled with the technology they need to learn and to develop because they also have aspirations. Um, and they want to do things that are different in the world. Um, yes, that might be their dream job, but they I'm pretty sure they have dreams that are bigger than that as well. Uh, and for me, it's about going tech isn't for us and Santon. It, it's actually for everyone. And how do we take technology as uh, deep as possible to reach everyone? Uh, I had a call yesterday with Discam and they were asking how do they how, how can I help them think about how do they reach their employees in the different places that they're at? And I was like, sometimes you need to think about technology and go back and go, if I want to give learnings to someone who doesn't have a smartphone, can I reach them by SMS? Can I send them some learning nugget by SMS? Can I use USSD? I'm pretty sure all of us have forgotten how USSD works. But to, to think about how do I enable that individual who has a life that's different from me to do better. And, and even in the space that I'm actually in, how do I enable the knowledge worker who is like me to go, how do I embrace tech to do things differently um, and not to just be single-minded about tech? I think then we're truly, truly unlocking something um, that's fabulous uh, and not saying to people, AI is going to take your job, but saying mm. AI can help you do your job differently and open the space for new possibilities. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tembi. And again, you know, um, you're such a promoter for allowing everybody to understand the business strategy. And I think that's something that that all of us can, can take forward. You know, if you're sitting at a leadership level, you know, make it your mission to, to let everybody understand the business strategy. And then you even take it further by saying, you know, let everybody also experience the technology as well, no matter where they are. So you're always pushing the barriers and that's why we love you so much. And we're just so honored to have you with us here for the second time round. And there, there are just so many wonderful comments coming through. And, you know, this hour with you has really given people a lot of time to actually pause and reflect, you know, in this busy world. And Farah says, purpose plus business goals plus technology equals joy at work. Yes. <laughs> Stunning, Farah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Because if we think about the time we spend at work, uh, applying to work, like and and putting our energy towards work, we want it to be a beautiful experience. Um, I love what I do, but I also love being happy when I do the work that I do, uh, and feeling like I'm making a difference. I'm I'm changing somebody's world, um, and that they can do something different for themselves, and then help the next person as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really love that. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks for that, Farah. And then also just um from Komotso, she's asking. Wow, I'm curious to find out what the name of the development app is that you spoke about earlier, Tembi. Oh, for the kids. Yes. <laughs> uh, so they build on something called Purple Mash. Um, 
So the the app that they were building is something for the kids to be able to navigate. So they had to build characters uh, as part of the story and then make the characters do things um, using low code, no code for kids, I guess. Uh, but that's what she enjoyed doing. And it was just having her think, you know, beyond that games are something I consume, but it's something that I can also write and, and you know, make it what I want it to be. Um, yeah make her brain work in a directed fashion. So I, I loved, it's a school app called Purple Mesh, but <laughs> and what they were building was on that app, yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Pam, shall we go back to you for the survey? Or would you like me to pick up some more? There's a lot coming in. Um, I just I wanna, if I may, Nate, I just oh. wanna bring up this question from Derek Hall. So. Derek is saying inspi um, inspiring insights to MB. He probably has a vested interest in this question, question, having read Dr. Cohen's The Mature Mind, along with your humanizing the humans. And his question is, how do you see collaborating with the older and even retired generation to boost productivity and innovation in the workplace? Oh, Derek, I feel like you were with me. I had a call yesterday, so I was in a call, uh, a lady who's retiring soon at work asked to have a, a chat with me. And she just wanted, she was asking if I think she was making a wrong decision by retiring. Uh, and we had this very deep conversation that my parents are retired, they haven't stopped working. It's very two different things. Um, they still add value meaningfully, it's just not by choice um, and the choice of things that they do. Uh, and so for me, it's, the wisdom that comes from people with experience is something that you can never get anywhere else. Um, and I always like to share, it's in my latest research paper that says, um, the, there's a Zulu proverb that says, in from people who've gone the path. So actually what it actually says is that if you want to walk a path, ask those who've walked it. Um, yeah. Um, so for me, there's such in valuable wisdom that we can get. So the conversation um, with the lady yesterday was that actually in my previous employer, people are going into retirement, they get put into a coaching program so that they can get, get a coaching certificate and they are helped to be able to articulate their experience and help the next person. Because one thing to have the experience, sometimes it's harder to explain because you've gotten it over such a long time. And mm -hmm. so they get given those skills. And for me, I think it's something that every organization should invest in because once they get that certificate, they are then helped to establish businesses so that they can invoice. And they talked about invoicing. They partnered with invoicing companies so that they can sustain themselves. Now they get to choose who they coach, when they coach, how they coach, uh, but they have the skills, they have the business set up, they know how to invoice and generate that money. And I was saying to her, with her skill set, there's no reason that retirement needs to be an end. It's actually a beginning where you have so much more freedom in terms of how you add value um, and, and bring that back into the workplace. And I think as, as organizations, we're doing a disservice to ourselves to just say, when someone retires, we wave them by and we never see them again because they take so much wisdom with them. We need to hold them close at their liberty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. Great question, Derek. I hope that that um, has ignited your mature mind as well. <laughs> so, um, Tammy, one last question before we go into wrap up then is what advice would you have for our guests who who want to change their mindsets? And we know that changing mindsets is not easy and, and, and the habits, et cetera, but what's, what advice would you give? What advice would you give all of us today? How, how do we change to be more curious, to be more aware, to be more in tune, to to be more confident. Sure, it's a lot, eh? <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. But I guess the one thing I would say is that for every HR person, I I always believe that we didn't land in a people space by mistake. We wanted to make a difference. We wanted to be part of someone's journey and story as they go through their careers. Don't forget why you started. So, so that would be the biggest advice I would give to each of us and to remind myself as well. Don't yeah. let the business of every day forget, make you forget why you started. Um, so go back to that. It will give you the energy to, to be curious, to experiment, to try different things. Um, 
And then for your businesses, always remind them that organizations who focus on their people outperform their competitors by 50%. Yeah. And they are more sustainable in future. And that's the one number you need to just keep telling them. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So ladies and gents, that brings us to the end of our um, collab with Tembi. Um, we will, I think I saw the... Um, uh, Tembi's LinkedIn profile being popped in the chat, ours as well from LRNG, mine as well. Um, and we welcome you to engage with Tembi directly. Um, she's so um, generous. So it, not only is she curious and amazing, but generous too. Um, we shall make some time for you if you if you need her to in an in individual capacity as well. Um, and then we'll pop a survey into the chat as well, which gives us feedback provides us with insights in terms of future collabs um, and what we might then do and change moving forward as well. So all that's been, um, all that's left to, to say is Tembi from LRNG and all of the guests on this, um, on this collab, thank you. You are an inspiration and we are genuinely in awe um, and we are deeply grateful for you spending this time with us. And to all of our guests, thank you for being with us today. And we look forward to extending an invite to you for future collabs. So thank you very much.